started. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for coming today. To, uh, the, the topic of our panel today is arcade machines. Yeah. Uh, we live in an era where there is uh, a big boom in hobbyist arcade um, collecting and maintenance and buying and selling. If you've been on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, uh, everybody's got an uncle, got a grandpa who's got a Pac-Man, got a Galaga in their basement, an old pinball machine. And uh, what we've done today is bring together uh, some panelists who have done a lot of the work for the last, you know, 10, 15 years of learning how this stuff works uh, as hobbyists, right? Uh, so, uh, well, before we get started, let's introduce ourselves and, and just do a real brief talk about kind of what your niche is. Okay. Yeah. My name is Chris. I am 30 years old. I live in the KC, kind of Parkville area. I've pretty much been playing arcade games since I was a little kid. My dad got me started with stuff like Galaga, Pac-Man. Then as I got older, I started playing more modern stuff. Dance Dance Revolution came out, and that was the coolest thing I had ever seen in my life. <laughs> and from there, I've gotten really into a lot of more modern Japanese arcade games. And what, which group are you here with? I'm here with KC Bamani. It's a local Japanese rhythm game community. So uh, if you have some interest in that, I can get you some links and you can join up with us. We have random events all the time where we have go to people's houses, meet up at arcades, and have a lot of public meetups. It's a good time. Awesome. Uh, I'm Sean Murphy. I'm 35. I am one of the visionaries who helped put on this event today, the All-in-One Gaming Expo. And I have been an arcade hobbyist as long as I can remember. Um, my father was a drummer in a band, and he actually spent a lot of his time before the shows hustling people on pinball. So uh, while uh, he wasn't as bit much of a gamer, we could connect over the pinball. That was kind of our commonality. So um, as I collected a lot of video games over time, uh, I needed to find heavier things, so I started collecting arcade machines. Uh, I've owned probably a hundred different arcade machines over the last 15 years, um, and a lot of them broke when I found them. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to talking today about the knowledge transfer. But uh, I'm here as a part of the Casey Bomani group and also as part of the King K group. So you can see a lot of our machines uh, on display here today. Uh, if they're broken, those one, those ones aren't ours. Those aren't ours. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm Adam. I'm 33. Uh, I guess I grew up in the arcades, uh, similar to you guys. Uh, we had a uh, place called Pop's Pizza like right next to my house. So I used to, you know, mow lawns for quarters and just like go down there. And uh, my dad used to pull me out of school to take me to the arcades back in the 90s uh, when a new game would come out. You know, uh, the big like 3D uh, arcade games were coming out at that time. Um, I've uh, been collecting for almost a decade now and uh, I've been like fixing them and everything. And uh, I work in the industry. I'm in the modern industry now for the amusements. So I see like all the new Stern pinballs, all the new like raw thrill stuff, I work on that stuff as well. So I have like an all around kind of experience uh, throughout like my whole almost a decade of doing this stuff. I, I've gone from making like little emulation machines and miniature arcades and selling those out of an apartment to like collecting and fixing broken arcades to working on locations to now I'm in like a distributing office and working with the big dogs now. So it's it's a real uh, privilege to be here and I'm really excited to talk about all this stuff today and um, a couple shout outs real quick. Uh, Kingcade, uh, bring in like the games and stuff. Um, I've done, done uh, work for Derek. Uh, he's a really great guy. Uh, he does a lot of work uh, to keep that community going and everything like that. And uh, and you can find him over at the Retro Zone booth. He's selling toys and collectibles today. Yeah. And kind of babysitting those cats. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> he's checking on those every now and then. So um, again, if you guys haven't checked out the arcade, please do that. I, I know um, that it might be a little bit full, but please like take some time and go go appreciate that and everything. So. That's, that's, that's all I got really to say. So you may wonder why we gave our ages. Uh, that's really important 
because a lot of the machines that we've talked about even starting with yep. and working on today, they came out before we were born, <laughs> yep. right? Uh, a lot of these machines, the parts aren't manufactured anymore, almost all of them, right? Yep. So uh, how did we get into it? Well, we had mentors. We had, we had the internet. We had Usenet. We had, you know, <laughs> downloading text files of old copied, um, you know, manuals and things like that. It has been a knowledge transfer. That's why we think it's really important to have this conversation today. Um, likening back to the original starting statement, you're going to find these machines on, online. You're going to find a Craigslist or a Facebook marketplace for a Neo Geo cab for $300 and the picture is dusty and old and the screen is off and you're going to say, is that a good deal? Is this where I want to get started in game and arcade collecting? Well, we've done that. <laughs> we bought that machine. We know what that looks like. All the ugly. So what I don't want you to do, because this, this industry is so niche, is buy that machine, get frustrated, sell it or put it on the curb, and forget the hobby. Because the hobby doesn't keep going without us. There are more machines every single day that are getting destroyed, that are getting dismantled, and they ain't making more of them. No. So we really, really need to keep the hobby intelligent and informed. And we're going to try to do that today with a couple questions to kind of generate some, some ideas. And then we'll open it up at the back end of it to, uh, for questions that you guys have as well. Welcome. Hello. So we'll get started with a kind of an icebreaker question, guys. Uh, what machine has taken you the most effort to get fully working, and what is the story behind it? I guess I have two. Um, I'll start with Muzeka. That was... Muzeka is a Japanese rhythm game that came out maybe, I want to say in about... Mm, 2010 or so. It didn't last very long in Japan. Um, the game was maybe online for about three, three years max, and then they destroyed the cabinet. They converted it to a completely different game. So it became a newer, more modern game, and I bought all of the parts that got thrown away. So over the last probably five or six years, I have slowly worked on finding people who had the remaining parts I needed, and I put that cab back together from just parts that people had dumped, and it finally works again. It's been a five-year project. <laughs> Jeez, and it's actually on show today. Yes, it is back there. I uh, brought it. And ironically, it. what happened with a lot of those games, too, is when they didn't sell super well, or um, and this happened even back in the day, they would uh, take those cabs and try to reuse them so yep. uh, vendors and, and arcade owners could buy kits that would convert those games over. So if you see like those kind of standardized uh, machines, like uh, like an old Midway cab or something, like they were meant to kind of get reused over and over again. And part of the fun is kind of digging into those cabs and figuring out what they were to begin with. Right? And figure out which ones certain parts went to, to know what you got to buy to get what you need. Right? So I started not here in Kansas City. I started in Wichita, Kansas. And I can tell you that collecting arcade machines in a smaller city is brutal. <laughs> because there's very, there were like two arcades ever, and when they went out, I mean, what was, what was there to buy and sell, right? Yeah. So um, I just tried to make sure everyone knew that I wanted arcade machines. Like, to get those uncles and grandfather basement machines. And a buddy of mine does a lawn care service, and he was taking care of a house, and the next door neighbor had passed away, and it started an estate sale. And inside that garage was like 10 pinball machines. And the guy had been on the last legs of his life for a while and was sort of at home and wanted some sort of hobby and bought up, again, like 10 pinball machines. Uh, but none of them worked. So the family is getting ready to sell these off and the lawn care guy goes, you know what, I actually, I know someone. So uh, he had me come over and I'll tell you, again, big or small city, when someone tells you they got a machine that you want, you gotta have the money ready, you yes. gotta drop what you're doing, you just go get it. Like, I, I don't even, I left work, I don't even think I told anyone <laughs> to go get these machines. And uh, the machine I wanted to talk about is a Last Action Hero pinball machine. Okay, so this is a Data East, it was uh, early 90s, and um, when I bought them, I bought them all without them powering on. And sometimes you don't want to power them on when you see them. No, because uh, you, you know you do that, and then they're like, "Oh, it works!" Now it's like now the price goes up because mm -hmm. sometimes they don't even know if it works or not. They they're not going to take the time to plug it in or whatever. They're just going to be like, "Yeah, I just want it out of my house." You know, or, so. or components might be loose yeah. as as things have been moved over time. If it sat for a while, I had a moon patrol that wasn't grounded right and blew the boards just from firing it on to see if it worked. Yeah. Well, this pinball machine had giant mud dauber nests all over in the, uh, uh, the backboards. Um, one thing you may not know is that uh, those capacitors and the, the uh, hardware on those boards, they stay warm for a little bit. 
So uh, little creatures and rodents and stuff, they'll love to get in there and nest on them because it creates warmth, right? So you always want to be careful. That's your first tip if you buy that Craigslist special is you definitely do want to take a look at everything before you fire it on. But that machine, I swear, literally everything was broken on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, everything was picking something, random piece, waiting two weeks, seeing how much further along it would go when I powered it on. Um, and uh, I finally got that thing fully working and uh, kept it in my collection for like 10 years. Just recently sold it. Um, we were out on a pick uh, a while back uh, down in uh, Oklahoma, and it's just, I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere, and this guy had a, I wouldn't even call it like a storage garage, it was like a wore down barn with like a, a, a dock in it, and on the inside, I mean, it's like something out of like Indiana Jones, it's just like all these dusty old pinball machines and like arcade machines and everything, and um, the reality of it was it was like 107 degrees that day and we're out there buying like 15 or 20 of them and I, I wasn't really interested in any of the pinballs because they were all like, this is going to sound gross, but they were all like covered in like cat pee and everything. Like cats had gotten in and like rats were everywhere and stuff. So I was going for like the arcade machines and I just happened to grab one that I thought was dusty but really what had happened was it was in a fire. And so I get it, I, we get it out of the building and everything, and it's like, it's too late to drag it back now, you know, we worked so hard to get it out of this building. So we load it up in this trailer and it barely fits, and we get it back, and I mean, that thing had like mud daubers in it, that thing had like dead mice in it, there was like a snake in it, I think, that was after the mouse. Um, but I mean, uh, and so the thing is, is like, yeah, they'll, They'll like uh, they'll chew on the wiring. They'll chew on like anything they feel like, and it was just like a pain in the neck to go through this entire wiring harness uh, to get this game to come on. And we finally get it. Uh, you know, the wire harness is all spliced up, and we get it all taken care of. And I remember flipping it on, and then like I see this like graphic come on the screen and then the next thing I know I just hear pop and all this smoke comes out the back of the machine because the magic the smoke. yeah the magic smoke <laughs> the monitor chassis was just done <laughs> and so I had to rebuild that and it was just like a very time consuming process and even when I got it working now I got to work on the body of the cabinet because it has like smoke damage on the side so we're like scrubbing this cabinet for hours trying to get this thing running but uh, yeah it finally came back to life and it was it was solid and everything after going through it and it was it's probably one of my most accomplished ones because it was just such a pain in the neck to just like get through and um, yeah I, I, I you know to this day I, I gave it to a friend of mine and it's still like in his basement and he's still playing it like all the time so I'd say job well done you know like <laughs> that's nice you know he brings up a good point about smoke damage uh, they uh, when all those components on those boards burn up it has a very distinct smell. Oh yeah, you know it when you when you know it when you smell it, and I'll tell you that smell will linger too. So if you are looking at machines, um, get get your head in there and take a whiff because you can actually learn a lot about what's going on. Uh, and when you turn it on, the heat um, on those components will create an odor as well. Yep. And that that's kind of like part of being like you know getting into like fixing stuff and being a tech anyway is like you want to use your senses and stuff like that smells sounds like you hear something crackling there's something wrong you know if you what i mean smell like, something like yeah. don't just leave it off yeah don't no, turn, turn it off, turn it off. Turn it off. <laughs> yeah it doesn't get better you're not burning away something yeah. that you didn't need anymore yeah like, you're burning something you do need yeah fortunately a lot of modern games have fuses here. built into the wiring harness so if something does break it might not damage everything yeah, and you're going to see that a lot on like the uh, post-2000 games. Yeah. That's where you're going to start to see a large shift in components. Um, so uh, the other piece I wanted to talk about on the smoke is, is water damage. Mm -hmm. Water damage is extremely common. Um, a lot of machines that come over they, uh, into the Midwest, they come from the coasts, mm -hmm. right? So especially when you're dealing with old machines, you're dealing with stuff that was on like the boardwalk, right? A lot of salt water damage. You'll see a lot of swelling towards the bottom of the machines. Uh, you kind of get that here, just like uh, so back in back in the day, you know, um, especially like places like Pizza Hut or whatever. You got uh, like a, a dweeby kid like mopping the floor, and he's just <laughs> sloshing the mop around, and he's yep. hitting the bottom of this wooden machine a thousand <laughs> times in a year, you know, and so it swells up and everything. And um, we get a lot of that too, is like the sides of the cabinets on the bottom and everything. You'll just see swelling. And it's, <laughs> 
it, it breaks your heart. <laughs> yeah. There, there are some remedies. They don't. Nothing beats the original. Nothing. Oh yeah. But you can definitely like cut or sand that stuff out and, and do like a bondo and match paint. Yes. Um, and it can look pretty good, but um, you know you'll always know the damage behind the scenes, right? So that, that's always a challenge. Absolutely. Um, let's let's switch to maybe like a fun one. This is kind of topical right now. Okay. Um, I want to talk about Billy Mitchell. Do you guys know who Billy Mitchell? <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, Billy Mitchell is the greatest video game player of all time. Of the century. Of the century. Okay. Yes. Featured on Time Magazine. He uh, he came to fame during the uh, early '80s when there were a selection of superstar arcade players who were kind of sweeping the, the, the news on how their capabilities of playing games like Galaga and Pac-Man and Donkey Kong. Uh, if you've seen documentaries like King of Kong, King it's, Kong yeah. it's really like all yeah. about him, right? Um, <laughs> we could talk a lot about him, but the important thing to know is is that while he was amazing, amazing back in the day, and is amazing now as a, as a player, he is. He is. Um, he's come under a lot of scrutiny for his performances at getting top scores. Now, in this in this industry uh, of of top score achieving for arcade games, they're all required a lot of times to record their video, their full performance, to hit these scores. Sometimes you're talking days of continuous play. Uh, it's grueling. There's a really great Nibbler documentary I recommend to see how that goes. That's like a three four years or three or four day speed run to get that top score. Brutal. Um, but just like performance enhancement drugs. Uh, for sports, it's not that Billy isn't good, but he absolutely is dead to rights on performing illegally in executing his top scores both today and in the past, yeah. right? So um, the big conversation right now is is how did he cheat? Why does it matter? And and, and how and like what's the ramifications, right? What does this do for the, for, for the, uh, the the community? Um, so real quick, just to give you background on on, on the things you can look up right now. Um, there's a Donkey Kong score. His Donkey Kong world record is the one that's most scrutinized. He's submitted several scores over years uh, and is in the uh, um, Guinness Book of World Records for it. Uh, he's chronicled uh, through Twin Galaxies, which was like for a good era, yeah. like the definitive uh, record keeping uh, uh, organization. And he's very litigious, he loves to sue. And through suing people for def defamation, uh, he didn't realize that those documents and information would have to get disclosed for discovery. Yep. Uh, <laughs> oops. Um, so th those documents have come out, and it's amazing. There's a single picture that shows him standing, shaking hands with the Twin Galaxies official with the Donkey Kong cab behind him. And in that one picture without the game on, we know he cheated. There's the joystick. Why don't you talk about that? All right, so... While joysticks are important, there's many different brands and many different styles. Some of which, you're gonna have four-way, some you have eight-way, there's also ones that go way more than that. That has to do with the number of directions that you're able to move it. Specifically, if I remember right, they had an eight-way that was in that cap. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you can perform some really amazing skips that you can't do with a normal four-way. It makes difficult techniques a lot easier. And, and let's talk about barrel manipulation, you know how that works? Yeah, so you go up the ladder and you can kind of steer the barrels uh, while also climbing the ladder, uh, which is something you can't do with like a four-way, because with a four-way you can only go up, down, left, right. With an eight-way you can go, you know, you have your diagonals and everything like that, or even a 49-way, you can mm -hmm. do whatever you want there. But um, And so the thing is, is like, uh, you're playing a game with a very big advantage at that point, and um, I would consider that I would consider that cheating, especially if it's not allowed. Um, you have to have all original hardware. It should be uh, an original Nintendo joystick, which is a tiny little thing. If you've ever played Donkey Kong, like it's it's almost like a toddler <laughs> joystick. But um, yeah, I, uh, I, that's that's kind of all I got to say about that. Really, is is uh, we're I'm excited to see where that goes, what he's going to say about that. Um, yeah. It's obviously not a Nintendo joystick. You can just tell by uh, the pictures of it. Yeah, you know right away. That, yeah. that original hardware is very important. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a combination of the actual joystick itself and some brackets that go in with the joystick that lock it into a positional frame. If you've played a traditional Galaga cab, that just goes left and right. Yep. You'll see that not only uh, is the, the, the actual like shaping of the control board will only allow it to go left and right. Correct. 
right? But uh, you look at a Nintendo cab and that looks, it's spherical. It looks like you can go omnidirectional. But you'll see plus signs, you'll see starburst frames for that. So you really want to be mindful as you do those renovations uh, to not discard those kind of brackets. You, you're like, oh, the joystick doesn't work, and you discard it, right? Or you just think that you want to get a nice, fresh one that gives that clicky sound or something, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, you want to be very careful and mindful of those. But um, uh, just to expound on, on why it's a big, uh, big uh, um, advantage, if you played the original Donkey Kong stage or seen it before, you've got this grid work system that's zigzagging up with ladders, and Donkey Kong's at the top just chucking barrels trying to destroy Mario. Um, what you don't, you may not know, is those barrels are actually listening to the input commands that you're putting in. If you're moving left and right, depending on what difficulty of level you're in, those barrels are more likely to come down at you. So if you stop moving, the barrels may not may not fall, right? So if you're coming up a ladder in a normal D-pad configuration, you can only go up and down, right, or left and right. So if you're doing diagonal, as that barrel is coming, there's a lot, you're on this ladder, there's another ladder here, you're going diagonal, that barrel goes, oh, he's moving, and it drops down early, yep. right? Yeah. So you really are at a significant competitive advantage with those type of things. So I just wanted to give some context for the people who need to visualize the Donkey Kong. Yeah, sure. Um, the other piece with him is emulation. Yep. Yeah. So um, you might see, uh, especially today, um, like things like Arcade 1-Up. Mm -hmm. So you can buy one of those at uh, you know a Nebraska Furniture Mart, uh, sometimes Walmart. You guys have seen them, the big boxes that say you can. Here's five games with them, right? Yeah. Um, we love and hate them. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Um, but not in an elitist sort of way. No, just no, no. just really more in the sense that they uh, they're really kind of a game on a chip. Yeah. That's kind of a way to think about it. Uh, and let's talk about games on chips. I mean, oh, well, well, okay. <laughs> um, so like. Um, Essentially, like, there's uh, different ways of how, I mean, if we're specifically talking about Billy Mitchell and his emulation and everything like that, there's uh, certain ways that uh, arcade, actual arcade hardware loads the uh, sprites and graphics and everything like that. Um, and emulation does it a different way, regardless if it's a ROM dump or whatever, because it's running off uh, whatever emulation software that it's it's ported to, whether that's MAME or MAME 2.506A or whatever, it, you know, there's so many of them. But, um, and essentially that's, that's kind of been a thing that's been uh, discussed in that community with uh, Billy Mitchell is that uh, he didn't use original hardware based on how the game loads on the screen. Mm -hmm. And they've compared the two with, uh, you know, a MAME version of Donkey Kong loading, you know, uh, here's a ladder and then here's the platform and then there's all the characters versus like the actual ROM one which does it in a completely different sequence. and. Um, you know, uh, people have, have argued, well, it's it's this version of this ROM or whatever, and it's not. It's not actual arcade hardware, and it's been proven that um, that that's not. A he's a dirty system. cheater. He's a dirty. He's a dirty man. Don't let him take, keep him away from your kids. <laughs> well, emulation is great for when you're at home, you're just trying to get a setup for your friends. You're never really going to get that true authentic experience. Um. Yeah, absolutely, uh, and so, and with certain games, there's a lot of games that are made to actually be played with the arcade cabinet, like there's trackball games where you have that rollerball like uh, centipede and everything, it just feels weird playing with a, like a joystick or a controller, um, it's still fun, it's just, uh, that's not how you're uh, made to experience it, um, I, I, I recently brought uh, Tempest to one of our last cons, and that uses a spinner, and a vector monitor and you just can't get that experience just yeah. sitting on your computer playing that game it's just like a whole different ballpark um uh, another thing about it is that you have like save states like <laughs> there i know that there are people that it's like i love save states because i can just keep going what's but, a save state a uh, save state is where like you're playing the game and then you could just like hit a button and like wherever you're at in that game it just like makes a it makes a save on it and so if you die and lose all your lives, you just like refresh yeah, back to that yeah. moment and you can redo it again. You can't exactly do that on an arcade <laughs> machine uh, because they want your money, and that's the truth. Well, um, and, and that's another piece that Billy's kind of uh, been accused of as well. There's a very classic video of, of a uh, world record that he did um, in response to Steve Weeb uh, doing a, breaking his Donkey Kong world record that had been around since well, the game came out. Mm -hmm. And you can watch in the video where there's like this static that appears on the screen and it, it really impacts the uh, score and you can't tell what the score is and then it sort of changes, right? 
So there was this this concern that he had used save states to sort of lock in the I, like a, another retry, yep. uh, you know, in a different scenario. And you'll see that a lot with speed running too. If you're into uh, like console game speed running, is the opportunity to sort of take a snapshot and create like the most ideal version of your run. Now, something like sa save states are advantageous if you're also trying to learn a game, because let's say there's a difficult part or just part of the game you don't really understand. Take a snapshot die, just go right back. Try it again until you understand it. But anything you do that in, it'll never be a true high score. But it's a great, it's a great learning technique. Totally great way. Yeah, there's some sequences you don't want to keep having to replay through, right? Uh, you brought up a good point that I want to move to the next question on, and that is um, the proliferation of replacing original monitors mm -hmm. in arcade machines. So you get that $300 Neo Geo special, mm -hmm. and you can like hear it. Oh, the game's working. I can credit feed it. It seems to be reacting. But I ain't got diddly squat on the screen. Yeah. That is a big piece when you're purchasing those machines, is those mm -hmm. monitors. When you talk about the value of those machines, <laughs> what they're worth, Knowing whether that ori it has original monitor in it, in it and that original monitor works as big. If you can communicate with those people in advance before you show up and you feel like you want them to turn it on, especially if they sound like they've turned it on in like the last 10 years, <laughs> um, have them. Turn it on and take a picture of the screen. Yep. Because that, the quality of that monitor is a big deal. They are not making CRTs anymore asterisk. There's some people who are making some, but they don't, they don't hold a candle to the originals especially when you talk about refresh rates and whatnot. Yeah. But uh, there was one monitor that you mentioned that I want to talk about, which is the Vectrix, or the Vector monitor. Yeah, so they have a... So we have our raster monitor that is what you'll see when you turn your television on, or when you... Old tubes. Yeah, the, yeah. Old, the, old, the good old tubes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, so... And, and how that works is it, it, uh, it takes electrons and it draws the picture from left to right. Um, With a laser behind it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it has a it has a, a, a magnetic yoke that, that directs the directs the electrons that hit that phosphor that creates your picture, which is you know it'll be red or blue or green, and it mixes those to to give us something on the on the screen, right? Um, well, a vector monitor actually works completely different uh, for the most part, and what it does is it, instead of it it just going left to right, it actually has its own like it's almost like a I want to call it a matrix, but I don't want to sound like super technical, but it draws it through lines. And so um, games like Asteroids, I'm sure you've all played something like that, where it, it, it just looks very primitive graphics, like, you know, uh, there's not much color to it, uh, and it's just like lines on a screen. It's, it, that's actually a vector monitor, and what it's doing is it's, it's, it's creating almost like a laser show. Really, and um, those are becoming incredibly hard to find, and we're we're trying so hard to keep those alive. Um, you can find those in the Vectrex uh, console system. I'm sure you guys have uh, heard about that. Um, some other games, uh, uh, Black Widow uses a color XY, which actually has the color to it. Uh, Tempest uses a color XY. Um, they were doing a lot of that in uh, the late 70s and early 80s. Just uh, just think of it as like high definition for that time. It really is. It's, it's Super incredibly sharp. sharp. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, 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 the resolution is so cool. And you can do a lot of really neat things with that. Yeah. Uh, but the fear is as people, the hobbyists, purchase those those machines and rule out that hardware. It yeah, doesn't yeah. work. It's So that it gets taken right to the dumpster. And, and I want to tell you right now, um, the, the, the education to work on those safely is out there. It's everywhere. Like, we are living in the golden age of information. You can, you can discharge those very safely, very easily, and pull the chassis. And those chassis are very easy to work on. They're not very intimidating. There's not a ton of parts on them. Uh, they're, they're all very pretty basic components, I would say. The, the problems you're going to have are, uh, to run into are, are finding things like, like a flyback, which is... Uh, the thing that adjusts the focus and the brightness for your thing, and it's also what, uh, you know, it pulls the electrons out of the tube and, and directs them to ground. Because if we didn't have that, you would just have, like, TVs just blowing up <laughs> in people's houses, you know? Like, you would get this cloud of electrons stored in this big glass tube until it couldn't take it anymore, and it just explode. And so we're very grateful for the flyback. <laughs> Um, I do want a disclaimer though, that while he mentions that there's a lot of information out there and how easy it is to discharge a CRT, it is not something that you should take lightly. You should no, definitely right. fully educate yourself. Yeah, uh, they store a tremendous amount of electricity and power in them. 
Um, so even if it's been turned on for just a little bit, it's charged, right? Yep. Yeah. You treat every monitor like it is, uh, it's been hot and on for a long time, and you need to like go to YouTube, watch the yeah. videos. You, I promise you after you've completely watched one of them, you'll know what to do, mm -hmm. but it is no laughing matter. You can absolutely hurt yourself discharging a monitor. And, and I, have, I am a testament. I have shocked myself so many times working on these. Yes. I, I can't see blue uh, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've shocked myself as well, even on monitors that have already been discharged. You still have to be careful after you discharge yeah. it. Don't touch the back of it. Because it does not feel good. Yeah, yeah. it's not good. You'll know. You'll know. You'll, you'll know. know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I know that we have a television that. Hi, Sean. That's my yeah. husband. Uh, we have a television that you use like a magnetic rod on mm -hmm. to make the picture uh -huh. better. Yeah. I I would love to hear more about it. Is that part of the? Uh, so what you're talking about is a degaussing coil. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what happens is uh, the Earth is kind of a giant magnet, um, and uh, sometimes what will happen is you'll set your TV up, and then the colors will be kind of off, or uh, someone has actually brought a magnet to your your tube and has kind of like moved moved the phosphor around a little bit, sort of, and so you'll get discoloration. So what happens is you got to use kind of this magic magnetic wand that's um, it's not really magic but I, I like this I like to pretend it's magic how do they work well when you wave it around on the screen you know you can chant something and then you pull it off and then all the colors have gone back to normal and so it's just a little dumb gimmick that I do at my job um, it creates the magnetic field it does uh, yeah, and so uh, what that does is it just it just puts the puts the electrons back to where they're supposed to go on the RGB phosphor that's on that tube. Um, there's I mean there's no real secret about it. It's it's electricity and a magnet, and that's <laughs> that's well, that's really what's which, what the deal is there. So and a lot of the machines, uh, even some some modern ones that use CRT, uh, they'll have a degaussing button, so you'll see degauss. And how that's working because we're talking about a wand, something you'd yeah. like plug into an outlet and sort of wave around like your Harry Potter. Um, decouse, a lot of machines are built to decouse themselves. Yeah, uh, 90s like PC monitors have yep. a lot of those. Like a lot of the 90s um, like arcade monitors have degaussing sections on them as well. So you don't even need a wand for some situations. Uh, it's still good to have one. Uh, I would mm -hmm. never say don't have one, if, especially if you're getting into like collecting tubes or PVMs or whatever, uh, they definitely are a lifesaver. That's the first uh, tool you, every arcade <laughs> owner should have uh, in their yes, toolbox. Kit, They're only like 20 bucks yeah. for a decent one. They're on Amazon. So not a big yeah. deal. But to explain the degaussing coil, yeah. so on, on your monitor, if you were to look from the back end, just imagine like a tube that's sort of coming together, you'll see a black, thick black wire that's running the perimeter of the, uh, the tube, and it is powered off of the monitor board. So a lot of times when those machines are turned on, it's stimulating that and sort of running that degaussing coil all around it. Uh, and then when you hit that button, it's sort of triggering it again, right? So that's another piece as you're sort of like hodgepodge your machines together is, um, you know, you're, you're sort of plugging everything back in. You bought a new monitor board off of the internet. You think you got the right thing. You're hitting it all and you've got this one last piece that doesn't work. You don't know where to plug it in. That's because that monitor board didn't come with that degaussing port on it. Uh, and you're gonna you're gonna end up having every once in a while to uh, sort of correct that, especially if it's been off for a while. Yep. yep. So that's uh, that's monitors. They're real they're they're real shocky, scary. But there are, <laughs> there's only a couple things that you really need to know to be able to work on them. And please don't throw them away. Never. Don't throw them away. Throw them away. Uh, put them put them somewhere. Uh, you, uh, preferably take the boards and put them somewhere in a static uh, you know anti-static bag or something like that. And find somebody local. I guarantee you, if it's not like one of us. Somebody wants those. Yep. Yeah. Um, and another thing, be careful with the necks. Uh, they have a very smooth, like, small, like, neck on the back of them. It's not a handle. Yeah, it's no. not a handle. No. Do not grab that. If that breaks, there's there's nothing you can do about it. That tube's done. Pull the chassis off and cry. Um, there was uh, one guy down in Springfield that he was able to fix that, and he's like. 90 years old and he worked for RCA back in the day and his job was to go around and like fix those cracked tubes on the assembly line that knowledge is dying with him he will not talk to me about any of it um, so please be very careful with the necks and please take care of the tubes we need those yeah, we absolutely do there's groups like us who can, can work on rebuilding them uh, so that's the same deal also is uh, this isn't a vacuum right guys we, we want to collaborate find the communities 
who are working on these kind of things. Just a lot of us, I mean, there's not a lot of money in it. <laughs> so we're, we're not, we're doing it for fun. We're doing it because we care, right? Um, and, but you can, uh, you can replace uh, with a um, flat screen LCD monitor, right? Uh, yeah, most games will, will accept that, you know. Um, you have to get a converter uh, for a lot of these games that uh, don't, uh, don't have the, the Brain fart, like this is a problem. Yeah, because yeah. uh -huh. yeah, you're, yeah. you're taking an analog signal and you're yeah. converting it to digital, yeah. right? So that there's usually boards you can buy online that you yeah. can piggyback off power for the, the unit, and it, it will accept the inputs for video that the the system is used to giving out, and output something that you can get uh, like modern monitors on. You'll actually see if you take a look at Black Tiger back in the arcade area, that was an LCD conversion, uh, and you can see it. It's good. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. Uh, <laughs> when you talk about, and we won't nerd out too much, we can almost have a, our own panel about why CRTs uh, for old games are, are superior. Mm -hmm. uh, you just take our <laughs> words for it. Um, but you, there's a lot of tricks that the uh, that the programmers were using to take advantage of how the, the curvature of the tube was and what area was displayed and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. If you play like old uh, old. NES games or Super Nintendo games on like an LCD, time. you could see like chunks of the screen on the left and right side that are doing like all kinds of funny business. They would actually like store code off the picture to like buffer and prepare video to be seen. So when you when you utilize an LCD or something like that, you're taking away the tricks and some of the magic that the original uh, developers intended to utilize for that space. And it can change the way that the graphics look and, and how the game plays. Exactly, it really can. Because it'll make uh, some stuff can load faster, which it really shouldn't, which will, again, affect how the game actually feels to play. So let's talk, um, let's lean more into your forte okay. with this, this topic, and let's talk about Dance Dance Revolution. <laughs> so I want to talk about old Dance Dance Revolution old caps. Dance Dance Revolution These are the caps, caps you would have seen in like the 2000s mm -hmm. era. These uh, ran on the big tubes. Yep. And um, what, am I thinking what, about that? Well, what happens when you put an LCD in something like that? So um, when you put an LCD in like an old Dance Dance Revolution cab, the display is not going to be as crisp. It's not going to look right. Even though you'd think a LCD would be a more clearer picture, the game itself was specifically designed for those CRT monitors. So um, a lot of modern, or not modern games, a lot of classic games are going to be made specifically for those types of monitors. And what about, talk to me about refresh rates, because that's really important in a rhythm <laughs> Refresh game. rate is really important. Um, <laughs> there's actually one that I brought with me which has an upgraded monitor to up the refresh rate. Um, the higher the refresh rate, the, I guess, clearer things are going to load. So let's say you have something moving up the screen really fast. If you have a really high refresh rate, you're going to be able to see every frame really nice. When your refresh rate is lower, it's going to be a little more blurry as something travels up the screen. And that will also really affect how things feel, specifically older Dance Dance Revolution. Yeah, very big deal. So at Rhythm Games, the timing is everything, right? Yeah, it's, it goes down to the millisecond. Um, there's, to get like a perfect score on one of those, you're hitting things within one or two frames of perfect. If you're even a frame off, you get a lower score. And having a newer monitor with a different refresh rate will change the timing of that. So your setup and someone else's setup, they're not going to feel the same. So um, I want to move to another topic that kind of is in lieu of this, okay. and that is uh, a modern hardware that we've put into machines mm -hmm. to sort of make them work yeah. and do what we want to do. And I want to kick it off with my Dance Dance Revolution yeah. machine. So it is, it's an old uh, Korean 2000 era uh, Dance Dance Revolution. It runs on a specific dedicated hardware arcade board. It's not a computer like you would think. It's not those typical components. Um, but it also is running on one of those old monitors. So that's a 15 hertz monitor. Hertz being the, the basically, think of it like the refresh rate. Yep. Right. So if you see a 120 hertz TV, 60 hertz TV, 240 hertz, you see that a lot when you go by. And there's a lot in that piece, right? Yes. So when taking that old monitor out, because uh, I wanted to upgrade, because I was going to take the old guts and turn it into a computer. So put a computer in there. But I want to use as much of the original hardware as I can. So uh, initially, I tried that CRT, <laughs> and that what you end up with is this really fast cycling yep. of the picture because it's trying to output at a refresh rate that monitor simply can't do. So I actually had to buy hardware that would in an old old video card from like <laughs> like early 2000s that would downgrade downscale that to a 15 hertz refresh rate so that that screen could be seen. 
And there's all kinds of little driver boards that you can plug in that will take the audio visual displays and the inputs off the, the pads and convert it over. So, you know, you think, oh, well, you know, I'll just put this computer in there and magic. Yep. Like, oh, hell no. It's a little more than that. My advanced <laughs> dance revolution machine is a little more hacky than yours. Cool. Um, I am a big fan of reverse engineering hardware. I put a lot of time and effort into it to figure out how the original hardware works and how I can come up with a DIY home solution for that that will function the exact same way. Um, I went with something like him. I bought a cabinet. And um, at the time, my wife and I didn't have a big space. So um, the deal was I could buy a Dance Dance Revolution cabinet, but I can only keep the pads. i got to get rid of everything else. Ugh. But I still wanted it to function the same. So in the time that I had the whole thing, I spent a lot of time working with the hardware, learning how it works, and creating basically something that's like a one-to-one -one copy, except it's uploaded onto a little device called an Arduino. Wired the pads up to that, wired it up to a regular computer, plugged it into a regular TV, and I have a working Dance Dance Revolution that works exactly the same as the cabinet. Nice. That's impressive. <laughs> it just looks a little funny. Two Missing different flavors, parts. right? <laughs> Do you have any stories of anything like that? Um, Two boards or well, uh, home DIYs? Uh, well, so like with the DIY stuff, uh, that's kind of where I got started in all this. I was never like, just like, oh, I'm just going to grab arcade games. Like I lived in like a small apartment while I was a, a teacher for the school district. And um, I was like, I don't have the room for an arcade machine, and so I started building these like portable like arcades, like almost like in a suitcase thing that you can just like take with you and everything. And so I was like building those and selling them out of my apartment. <laughs> and then I I started getting really like silly with it. I was trying to make it as small as I could, so I was putting it in like Altoid tins. And so <laughs> like imagine like uh, so like when Pokemon Go came out and everything like that, people are walking around playing like Pokemon Go on their phones. I'm walking around with this thing that looks like it's been pulled out of the trash because it was, and it's like this Altoid tin, and I'm playing like Fire Red on like this emulator thing with like a Raspberry Pi and everything, and it's <laughs> there's like wires sticking out of it and everything, and um. And so that's is like, I guess that's like my DIY story is like, that's kind of what got me fascinated with like arcades and wanting to save them is, um, I just kind of like got the urge to get the real thing, you know? Um, and unfortunately I don't have any like stories with DDR or anything like that other than I played it a lot when I was working for the school district. Kids love that game. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, like. That's, that's where that's at. <laughs> so in, in the interest of time, I want to switch over to uh, if you had to make a toolkit, right? So this is like the five, ten things that you really shouldn't uh, get started without. Yeah. Um, so let's move through this really quick uh, because sure. I want to get to some questions. Yeah. Maybe you'll remember the exact name of this, but there's a certain choir, a Japanese one, that is very good for getting it stripped screws out. Oh my uh, god. I cannot remember its name. Well they have they have some there's a couple ways you can get strip screws that are really important. There's uh there's some bits that you can actually drill into the mm -hmm. screw and it will like lock into it and then allow you to pull it back out. Uh, those are really important, especially on dance dance is notorious yeah. for it. Because a lot of the screws that are on the pad, you need to get under that. And it's like steel. I don't need yep. like you, you wouldn't get through it unless you're taking it the normal <laughs> way. And Man, I've had times where I've cut screws off Same. Um, because you just can't get through those. And so, you know, getting tools like that, the plier type yep. tools. Um, I want to get started with the number one tool. It's a multimeter. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Percent. Absolutely need a multimeter. <laughs> things work. A multimeter, small handheld tool. It's going to have a positive and negative prong on it. Uh, you can... You can poke and prod and find out things like voltage and amperage, wattage, and you can find out which components aren't working. Um, a lot of power supplies are actually outputting several different voltages. You've got a 5, you've got a 12, and knowing which one isn't working or working correctly is really important to diagnosing what boards you might think are broke. Yep. Uh, it's easy to look inside a cab and go, well, there's three things, and it's got to be one of these. And so you buy one by one. I've done this, especially when I started. Uh, yeah, yeah. I replaced that board, I replaced that board, I replaced that board. Still ain't working. Because I don't actually, haven't actually diagnosed the, the problems with the power. Yeah. So uh, multimeters, uh, what you can buy um, over the shelf is going to work oh, great. Oh, yeah, 100%. You do get what you pay for. Um, so, you know, a multimeter in like a $30, $40 range, great. If you can afford like a $100 multimeter, they can get down into a lot of, of very like sub like readings that are sort of important as well. Um, so you've got to get a multimeter. Uh, there's a lot of YouTube videos that will teach you how they work. Um, that's fine. 
you don't need to like memorize Ohm's law to be able to <laughs> utilize a multimeter. Um, but it's super duper important uh, in diagnosing what's wrong. Uh, what's another good tool? Uh, soldering iron, definitely. Soldering yeah, iron. Being into a lot of reverse engineering and repairing of boards, I use my soldering iron daily. Um, you have components that go bad, capacitors, they blow after a while, they don't last forever. You gotta replace them. And soldering is incredibly easy, desoldering is pretty easy as well, and being able to do that yourself will save you a lot of money versus paying somebody else to do it. And learning how to solder or desolder and replace components, is, it's very, very simple. Anyone can learn to do that easily. Well, one thing I do recommend there, uh, if you just want the, the easiest and most efficient way, is look for like a technical college in town. Mm -hmm. Um, they'll have soldering classes. It's something you can take after work. Super important. You're going to save yourself, if you can do it good and reliably, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. If you're looking for uh, uh, cold solder, so a solder being, you know, the components usually have long leads on them. They're like the little tiny chips and stuff you see on the boards. And they'll have long leads that run through the boards and are on contacts. And then you solder. You're putting metal onto the board to sort of establish a, a firm contact between those leads and the board itself. And some of those solder jobs have been, well, like 40, 50 years old. Yeah. So they, the, the, you, you might hear of like the term of cold solder, right? So that's, it looks there, it's, it's visible, the component isn't wrong, but that contact between the, 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 the component and the board isn't there anymore. So like learning to reheat that solder and to sort of reactivate it is really valuable. But look at, uh, seriously guys, look, look at those technical schools. You can, you can learn really great there. If you don't want to do something like a technical school, a lot of maker spaces have people there that do this as well. Um, usually they offer classes for a pretty reasonable price. Just a one-time class, they'll teach you how to do it, and you can borrow their tools. Yeah, you're talking about if you have the soldering iron, uh, turning like a $75 repair job into like 50 cents. Mm -hmm. Right? It, so, you know, you're multimeter and you're moving through and identifying the bad component, and then they're, they're, those components are still cheap, so that's great. Uh, not as cheap as they used to be, yeah. but they are cheap. And then you can replace that, that, that piece. And it can be a fun hobby. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of fun to be had in, in learning how to solder. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to save you guys a lot of frustration here and go with some really simple tools. One of them is a headlight or a <laughs> flashlight. You will need that if you're getting into an arcade machine or a pinball machine. I oh, promise yeah. you, you will not regret that. Um, I did not have one for a long time, and sometimes I would just get so frustrated. And the reason I would get frustrated is because I couldn't see. And um, so please, like, do yourself a favor. Go out and spend, like, five bucks and just get, like, one of those headlights or, like, a light magnet that can stick to something. And uh, it's, it's very basic, but I promise mm -hmm. it's very... It's very time saving. Um, another thing uh, I would say is get a magnifying glass. Yes. Uh, when you're looking over components and everything, the smallest details sometimes matter. And sometimes just just by looking at it, like you can't just see what's all there. You gotta really dig in deep. And like the cold solder and everything like that, you can't always see that. You have to sometimes zoom in a little bit. Um, but those are like two like really simple. I think everyone knows how to use those tools um, to like. Put in your put in your kits. I promise, like you will thank me for that. Um, uh, uh, if uh, if we want to go for like a technical tool, another thing I would get is probably like wire snips. Oh, yeah. um, you're going to be changing wires. You're going to be working on harnesses. You want a good pair that can you know crimp on stuff. You want a good pair that can strip wires. Uh, please don't strip wires while the game is on. Um, not good. Not good. <laughs> um, not good. But don't, but don't um, get in the habit of using like a pocket knife to strip wires or something like that. Like, you'll see us do it. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of a do as I say, not as I do. Exactly. Yeah. But a, but a good pair of wire strippers, you're gonna find those at like a Home Depot or yeah. Lowe's. Uh, just go to the electrical sections. Ten bucks. Yeah, you're looking Ten for bucks. ones that it'll look like you know pliers, but they'll have uh, little little bites in them like teeth. And what those are doing is identifying the gauge of wire that you're supposed to run through it. And when you're utilizing one, you're just going to kind of find the one that fits comfortably, and then you'll pull it off. It's really simple. Uh, so. if, if I can add one more. One more. Uh, one more. If you're out there uh, for a while, uh, I think in the early 90s, if so if you're out for those kind of games, they used what's called uh, security screws. And they require a special bit. They're like yes. a star with like a little dot in the center. And like you need to go out. Uh, Harbor Freight sells a whole pack of all kinds of different special bits for like five bucks. Um, do yourself a favor, get that, uh, especially if you're looking for a lot of 90s stuff, because 
uh, arcade operators would take like the actual hardware out and put those on because they were sick of kids like coming and unscrewing everything and ripping parts out and and all that stuff. So that's that's also going to save you a lot of frustration. Uh, put it in your kit um, and yeah, fix stuff like. <laughs> and a lot of these tools we have in the back uh, where the arcade section is. I have a quick handy tool thing that sort of help out the other arcade machines if they go down. They will. Uh, oh, machines will. will be broken this weekend and we will go and fix them. <laughs> so we do, we just have a smile on our face. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Yeah. Uh, I want to open for any questions anybody might have. If there's any uh, machines you have at home or any weird stuff that you've encountered or um, um, uh, you know, old wives tales about what you should do and not do with an arcade machine. A any questions? I do. It's more about your guys' personal experiences. I know that obviously we always want to stay local, we always want to buy from local communities, but what is the furthest you have ever traveled for an arcade part or an arcade machine? <laughs> um, so, I, we, um, we went to an auction out in Detroit, um, and so I'm getting on this plane, we flew out to Detroit, which was an experience in itself, um, if you've ever been there. Uh, but we, we go to this auction and then we meet up with this guy who's like reproducing a uh, zookeeper panels, actually control panels. So he, he works in some like metal factory or whatever and he has this machine and he's able to make these brand new panels for a control panel. They're, they're made of metal. Anyway, they're very hard to find. And so I'm, I buy this thing and I can't just like <laughs> ship it back. So here there's like a photo of me carrying this like zookeeper control panel onto an airplane and people are just like what is that and i'm like it's a control panel for an arcade game and mm -hmm. they're like that looks dangerous so i'm like it's perfectly harmless and i'm like shoving it under a scene and everything you know so i can't believe they let me on the plane with it i thought for sure they were going to tell me to throw it in the trash but yeah you can yep. you can bring your arcade control panels with you on planes if you fly delta <laughs> <laughs> so so my my story comes with another recommendation for a tool uh, starting out very early, I, uh, I'd buy a anything on my hit list, like, without a question asked. And uh, in Oklahoma, uh, there was a pair of initial D racing games that came up for sale. Killer price, looked great, the guy knew what he was talking about, I knew it would be worth the drive. Uh, I had been collecting for like five seconds, so I'm like, Chevy S10, screwdriver, let's go. And I go, I go rolling down there, it looks great, we're excited, me and a friend, we high five, we're gonna get initial D's, how cool. Uh, he's like, great, I gotta go, so he rolls them out of his garage and he's like, out. So it's just the two of us, so we gotta get these machines on the, the, on the truck, and uh, this leads me to my recommendation, and that is straps. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> I would recommend a way to strap a machine down. Uh, very, very important. They're very uh, heavy. And correct. They damage a lot. <laughs> extremely heavy as well. Never underestimate a cab, especially like the sit-down ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you're talking seven, eight hundred thousand pounds uh, for some of these machines. And what it led to was a friend halfway out the window in the back of the <laughs> S10, just holding them like this <laughs> for like two hours on the drive back. And they would just pop and they would go sideways inside the, 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 the truck and we'd have to pull over real quick yep. and try to rip, but pull them back up. They got there okay. I can see some faces. <laughs> I'm here. I didn't get crushed. But uh, it, it keeps going though, right? Because uh, at that time my arcade was in the basement uh, and I had a very narrow staircase. And so we start getting them down. I do some measurements. I'm like, yeah, it's, uh, it's long enough. It's, uh, it's wide enough. We're going to be okay. Um, but the stairs, the diagonal enough, created a real big problem. And the machines actually got jammed on the stairwell. And we were, it was the two of us. I'm on one side and he's on the other, just kind of shouting at each other what we see. And it took us another like four hours of just dismantling it on the staircase. And the only thing holding it up is the sheetrock for the staircase. <laughs> So it actually got to the point where it dislodged, and uh, it was like Indiana Jones. <laughs> but I'm here. Yeah. It was okay. It's, it's, I was on the bottom. <laughs> if it's your machine, you. be on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Gravity is your responsibility. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so the farthest I have physically gone has been Ohio. I mentioned earlier Muzeka being my kind of pride and joy. Um, some of the pieces I needed for that, a uh, friend and I drove. 11 hours up to Ohio to go pick those up. Um, a guy had just converted his Muzeka to the newer game, and he had a bunch of leftover parts. He didn't have all of them, but he had a good chunk of them. And it was one of those deals where he's like, 150 bucks, get this out of my warehouse, and come up here and get it. And you know, that was that was a steal. It was a deal of a lifetime, and it was worth every penny of gas to get there, <laughs> and every meal I bought my friend who came with me. 
<laughs> Some of the other parts I've had to get from that. While I didn't physically go there, I had to work with a lot of people in Japan to help find some of these parts and get them to the US for me. Uh, the coin door from it also came from Canada. Just happened to know someone there who had it, so. Yeah, if you get a chance yeah. to see the rhythm games that are back there, those are a particularly small quantity out in the wild. Yes. So it's very, uh, we're very thankful for Casey Bamani uh, group to bring a lot of those cabs because we're talking machines that are in the hundreds totally manu like complete manufactured, let alone now. And in the United States, I mean, some of them are double digits. Exactly. Um, Museka was one of those because it only lasted for three years. They didn't make a lot of it. And it got the ones that existed in the wild got converted to a different game, and all the old parts just got trashed. Yeah, we have no idea what the populations are on those, which is why it's really important, again, don't throw something away. There are, there are junkers like us who want it. Yeah, I, all the time I'm browsing Japanese auction forums to buy parts from really obscure machines that you just don't see in the country. So I can buy those parts and start building those machines from scratch here. Any other questions? Concerns? We're still alive. <laughs> awesome. yeah. Well, it's uh, there's no, five minutes left. He's oh. got it. He's got a question. Got um, is is there any cabinet or machine currently that is like your most sought after thing? If you haven't already found it, and if you have already Good found question. it, is there like a, a number two? Yeah, we'll move, let's that. move through this one a little quick. But do you have a do you have um, a? I, I guess I do. Um, Museka was mine. Um, Save with mine nostalgia, too. which are two games that are out there right now. I brought them with me today. Um, but there is another that I'd like to find, and there's actually one locally in one of the arcades here. Um, it is a certain version of Space Zap that has no joystick, and it is all buttons. Um, there's one of those in Zona Rosa at uh, Draftcade, and it is absolutely fun, and I highly recommend playing it. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, I've, I've really been on the lookout for a F-Zero arcade cab. So F-Zero being a Nintendo franchise, there was a brief period of time where Nintendo worked together with Namco and Sega, they created a hardware called the Triforce, because there's three yep. of them. <laughs> like, developers are cute. <laughs> and uh, so they created a, a small batch of different games um, that were focused on basically GameCube technology hardware. And there's a version of the F-Zero for GameCube that is um, fully motion. So the cockpit will actually move with it. And what makes that version really neat is while it plays very similar to the GameCube, it has unique tracks. Those tracks are exclusive, and it actually has a GameCube port on the machine. And you can take your GameCube memory card and plug it in, and it will write files to that memory card that unlocks those tracks for your home console game. So Nintendo has screwed you out of tracks in F-Zero. <laughs> but I really, really Circus wanted Circus one of those full motion like cabs. Out of all the machines I've owned, I have big environmental cabs you climb into and shoot guns and stuff, but I've never got to own a full motion cab, and I can't wait to work on it when it breaks every five seconds. <laughs> uh, or like maims somebody. Uh, that's one of the things, the more moving parts, the more likely something is to oh, also yeah, break. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's so why most people don't buy pinballs. Yeah. I'm the only dummy who brought some. You gotta do a lot of maintenance. Because um, it's not just like buying and replacing parts and they work, you gotta do upkeep on them to keep them in good condition. Yeah, if you uh, get a chance to, to go to a, like an arcade enthusiast house for like a get together or something, you'll usually see them with like a screwdriver in their teeth, like crawling around <laughs> and like fixing stuff. Like, I'm playing whack-a-mole, just fixing machines as they break yep. in this <laughs> setting. Um, so I recently actually grabbed one of my like top holy grails, which was Tempest, and that's like the Atari vector game that I was talking about with the spinner and everything. But there's two more that I am looking for. I'm looking for an Atari Food Fight. If you've ever played that game, it's like super Very good. Fun. And when I showed up here today, I got I freaked out because I saw like a banana joystick in the rhythm <laughs> section. Well, Atari Food Fight actually like came out with like a super rare banana joystick for that game, mm -hmm. and I I've only seen probably like two of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then another game is called Bubbles, and it's made by Williams, and it's one of their earlier. Actually, it's a later game. It's it came out. Game. It's a later game, and. Uh, essentially, you're just like a bubble in like a sink, and you're just going around picking up mucus like the whole time and getting bigger and bigger, and you're avoiding like razor blades, and there's like a lady that's like sweeping in the sink, I don't know, but uh, anyway, so yeah, those are two that I would really love to have in my collection. Since you brought it up, um, I guess I've got to mention, Monkey Ball is also one of my holy grails. Uh, Monkey Ball Arcade is phenomenal. Um, in there, um, the, ba the banana joystick you mentioned is something that I put together. That is a DIY controller for Monkey Ball Arcade. So if you've never played the arcade version, please go give it a shot. 
Grab some friends and go play Bishy Bashi. Oh yeah, play Bishy Bashi. It's the big, crazy, stupid controller that's in there. And if you leave without smiling, then something in you is broken. Yeah, it's a really fun mini game collection. You get like four of you. You all work together um, or against each other if you want to uh, try to beat each other. It's a yeah. great time. Really, really so good. much fun. Well, that kind of concludes our time today. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming. Mm -hmm. uh, if you'd like to talk more about Arcade, you can tell we have a lot that we'd love to share. Please. Uh, Grab us, we'll go yeah. talk about arcade machines, tell you more in depth. Uh, I can show you some of the tools also that we have in the space. You'll probably see us hunched over somewhere working <laughs> on something. Uh, but please, uh, be knowledgeable, be excited about the hobby. It's uh, the best time to get into arcade is right now. Yeah. Uh, and I want to thank you all for coming. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you guys. Um...